we have really exciting things to cover today. As every week have been exciting topics. Um, and as you know, um, the topics that we've been covering are not just random topics, um, but Adam Hamilton did a survey of people in his very large Methodist church um, and found that the, the fears that we've been talking about are some of the, um, were some of the ones that were rated highest that people had across all ages um, and across all demographics in his church. And so um, the, that's why these are the, the topics that we have. Let's have a prayer and then we'll start. God, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for the breath that, that fills our lungs, that um, gives us life. We thank you for your Holy Spirit um, that also gives us life in you. And God, we pray now that as we discuss um, these topics that we generally like to avoid uh, because um, they're not the most interesting or fun things to talk about, God. We just uh, pray for your guidance and for your Holy Spirit's presence with us. We thank you again for this day and all the possibilities that it holds for us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, the first topic we have today, and I will say that you will not be hearing from me the whole time. We have Brittany Glazer here from um, our Summit Counseling Office, um, who's going to talk with us in just a little while. Um, I think having um, other voices, especially such wonderful voices, be able to speak, <laughs> really setting it up good, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> speak to us is a wonderful thing. Um, she's one of our wonderful um, counselors here in our satellite office, so she will be sharing with us in just a little while. The first thing we're going to talk about is aging. Um, and so Adam in his book talks a lot about people in scripture. And if you know about one of the things we like to talk about about scripture is how God turns a lot of things upside down, right? Um, in Christ, God turns this idea of what a king looks like completely upside down from what the world expects. Um, and in scripture, we see a very different image of, of aging than maybe we do in our world today. Um, so a couple of people that he talks about are Noah, who was obviously very old when he, when he built the ark and when he trusted God. Abraham and Sarah, other folks that we know who um, were 75 and 65 when God revealed God's plan for them. And they had to step out in a huge leap of faith, right, to trust what God was going to do. Um, Moses was 80 when he got his calling to go to Pharaoh. It's terrifying. Um, a terrifying call anytime. Uh, Joshua was 80 when he led the Israelites into battle. So um, we have all of these folks in Scripture who... Um, who have lived to a wonderful age, and God has a very important purpose for them um, in their life where they are. And I want us to look together, if you have your Bible or your phone, at Luke 2, 25 through 38. Um, who can tell me um, who we're about to read about? This is when Jesus is dedicated in the temple. Who are the two people that encounter Jesus in the temple? Anyone know? Who? Anna and Simeon. Very good. So we're going to read about them, Luke 2, 25 through 38. So I want, I'll read this for us. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the Lord required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the rising and falling of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phen Phenuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband 70 years after her marriage. And then was a widow up until she was 84. 
She never left the temple, but worshipped day and night, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So this is a really wonderful scripture that we have um, from Jesus' early days. You know, we don't know a whole lot from when Jesus was born to when Jesus started his ministry. We have just a few accounts, and this is one of them, and it involves Simeon and Anna and um, what they were doing at this stage in their life and how God was able to use them. So a couple questions for us in, the, in terms of this scripture. What role do Simeon and Anna play in the story of Jesus? Hmm? Prophets. Prophets. Yeah, they, they share what, what Jesus is going to do, what Jesus has come to do. What else? Any other thoughts about that? Both a blessing and a warning. Yeah. Those are hard words that they share. <laughs> um, they're great words, but they're also very hard words. Any other thoughts? How are they models for thinking about God's intentions for us in old age? Yeah, they were active. They were part of the story. Very good. What other thoughts? Spent time in prayer. They spent time in prayer. That's wonderful. Say, they, they were just older youth, so they had joy. They were just older youth, so they had joy. That's a great plug for our joy ministry, for the lunches, and for the choir. Very good, Carolyn. Excellent. If you want to know more about that, talk to Carolyn. Anything else? So this is one of the scriptures that Adam points to that really kind of sets up um, an idea about God's intentions for us. Um, and then he kind of sets this in contrast to all the things we see in the media today. So think about pharmaceutical advertisements that you see on TV. What are some of the things, you don't want to think about that? Okay, well, Mike's not going to think about it. Everybody else, think about um, what are some of the um, advertisements that you see on TV, and what do they kind of tell us about aging? What are some of the things you see advertisements for? Pharmaceuticals, drugs, anyone? Don't be shy. We all know they're out there. Yeah. They'll make you live longer. Yeah. Okay. Very good. What else? Really cheerful help with a problem and then 50 side effects. Yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, we see advertisements for Botox, right? Um, that's one of the main ones, I think, um, that we can think of. Um, and what is, what is an advertisement for Botox? What is it really saying to us? Stay young. Stay young. You look bad. You want to look better. <laughs> you look bad. You need to look better. Right. Um, I, I hear... One of the worst ones is for, um, I think it's for um, spray tans, which is better than, you know, um, going to a tanning bed, obviously, for your overall health. I say that as I am sunburned up here right now um, from the real sun. Um, but, I mean, some of these advertisements, it's not even directed at people of a certain age. It's just directed at um, beauty and what beauty is supposed to look like. And so I think even that, as, as we get older, still is something that that the media targets for us. What other things? Um, so we see all these advertisements for different drugs, right? And, and what do the people usually look like in the advertisements? They look like they don't need the product. <laughs> they look like they don't need the product, right? Yeah, they are, they are yeah. Um, yeah, they look like they have no need for that. Yeah. Um, so what are the potential side effects that are mentioned in some of these? We talked about they look really happy, but then they mention... They talk really, really fast and mention about 49,000 things that could go wrong. So what are some of the side effects? Death. death. Yeah, it's always, it's at the very end, right? And potential to, for death. Um, I mean, a lot of them you will hear, you know, side effects of suicidal thoughts or behavior. I mean, these are really scary, um, you know, really scary things. Um, depression, all of these things that, that can be a side effect. And so, you know... 
We know that we need different drugs for different things, obviously. Um, they can keep us very healthy, but then also people are willing, what those commercials tell me is that people are willing to risk a great deal oftentimes for things that society tells us that we need. Again, we definitely need certain drugs to, to help and, and doctors' um, recommendations and all that are very important, but we are willing to risk so much because of what society tells us that we need um, and what society tells us aging needs to look like. Adam talks about um, there is a, a fear that the older we get, the less happy that we will be. Um, but evidence suggests, and he references a few different studies in his, in his book, that self-reported happiness drops in the 20s, drops in the 30s, drops in the 40s, and then in early 50s begins to turn around and people get happier. So what are some things that happen in life, what are some things that happen in your 20s and your 30s and your 40s that may, this is not for everyone, it's, you know, it's um, a study, but what are some things that may happen that may cause you to be less happy? I knew that one. Oh, no. stressors. I mean, children are wonderful, but they, there are a lot of things that you haven't thought of that you haven't had to think about before that you have to think about. Expenses, um, health, the, just the well-being of another human being besides yourself. I mean, those are all things that are wonderful. I think we would all agree, um, but that can cause um, anxiety and stress at a different level than we've ever known before. What else could be happening in your 20s, 30s, maybe early 40s? jobs and establishing yourself in your job and really trying to uh, make a career for yourself. You're probably working longer hours for less money in a lot of cases. Um, you're really trying to establish your career. Um, and so a lot of other things also kind of play into this. But um, so what, what oftentimes happens in 50s, 60s? What are some things that happen in those periods? Retire. Retirement. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> um, also, um, I'm sorry? What? Get better. <laughs> Empty nest, which obviously comes with a lot of emotions around it. Um, hmm? The mortgage gets paid off. Yeah. You get cynical and you care less. <laughs> Yes, so some of the things that, that the book talks about are, and that these studies talk about it, are that we have more reasonable expectations, um, more appreciation of the things that we have, more time to spend, hopefully with family and friends, um, hopefully more time for hobbies, travel, other leisure activities, less pressure and stress to meet other people's expectations because we're a little bit more cynical and we just don't care. <laughs> um, we tend to have fewer negative emotions and more positive emotions um, and the breadth of our life experiences lead us to be less overwhelmed by adversity so these are all things that come with life experience which come with age and so all of these things um, you know that that we're talking about are not going to um, completely allow us to get rid of all of our fear about you know growing older or aging but they do, I think, allow us to have a different perspective, our biblical view, um, and then this understanding of, of just the life stage that we'll find ourselves in hopefully can make it a little less um, scary if it is something that we fear. So in your own lives, wherever you are, um, depending on where you are in life, have you found these things to be true? Yes. The things that are stressors and then the things that might get better as you get older, generally speaking. So one of the things that um, contributed to happiness and a high quality of life in older adults in these studies, what do you think is one of the things that really contributes to the, the happiness and overall health of older adults? Grandchildren, okay. I'm sure these are all in there. I'm looking for one in particular because you all are well on your way to happiness because you are faith community. Yeah, it's a huge part. Um, the, the happiness um, is increased when you are part of a faith community and when you have that support. 
um, which so you guys are already on your way, well on your way, so very good, congratulations. <laughs> so um, one of the things, the last thing I want to talk about about aging is we have our acronym that we've been looking at. Um, so, and this is, you know, the acronym for FEAR. Um, face your fears with faith, examine your assumptions in light of facts, attack your anxieties with action, and release your cares to God. So, some questions for us to consider, and we won't stop to talk about these right now, um, but facing our fears with faith, how does our faith, or the Bible, help us to face a fear of aging? So that's something that we can consider um, in our own life, in our own study of scripture. The second one, examining our assumption in light of the facts, what things did I believe about aging as a younger person that have turned out not to be true? So, and if, if there are those things, then share them with younger people so that maybe they won't have to be as afraid of the process of aging. Um, attacking our anxieties with action. What is something that I can do to make aging less scary? If it is scary, what is, what is one thing that we can do? And it's probably not taking some of these drugs that have all these side effects <laughs> on TV. Um, and then releasing our cares to God. What practices or prayers will help me release these cares to God? And do we spend enough time um, in scripture and in prayer um, looking at um, how God uses people of all ages and all stages of their life? Um, because reality is that ageism is something that is real in our society. Um, it's something that is a big, a big deal and a, a real issue. And so it's something that we have to... Um, in our, in our faith lives, but also in just our everyday lives, be able to, to have a good perspective on. So um, that is all I will say about aging. I hope no one is fearful of getting old now. Um, but um, I'd like to invite Brittany up now. Um, the next section of the book is called Anxiety, Worry, and Physical Illness. Um, and this chapter talks a lot about mindfulness and some practices. And so Brittany is here um, to share with us about some of these things. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm really excited to be with you guys. My name is Brittany Glazer, and I'm a staff associate therapist at the Summit Counseling Center. And I've actually been here for the past two years. So it's like the office when you go into the main, and there's kind of that like office back there. That's usually where I'm hanging out. Um, and I work a lot with kind of middle school age up through older adults on issues like depression, anxiety, grief, um, life transitions, so part of that is aging or illness, um, or you know, divorce, or any other life transitions that happen on the spectrum, um, LGBTQ issues, and spirituality. So if you have any questions about kind of what that looks like, or therapy, or counseling, or whatever, I love talking about it, so I'll be hanging out afterwards. Feel free to ask me. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about anxiety, illness, and mindfulness. Um, you don't have to like shout out answers, but raise your hand if you've heard the term mindfulness. Yeah, okay, good, I'm like, good, my pulse is right. I was like, I feel like this is this thing that's becoming a buzzword, um, and you know, kind of everywhere I look, there's a magazine for mindfulness, or you know, I work in the high school sometimes helping out with students there, and you know, they'll be like, how can we get mindfulness into the classroom? Um, but what a lot of people don't know is that mindfulness came into Western society through working with patients who were physically ill. So the person who kind of brought it here, obviously he did not create mindfulness, it's kind of rooted in Eastern tradition, but it was um, Dr. Cabotson, and he was working in a hospital with people who were chronically ill, and I think it was something to do with back... Ooh, I probably should have looked at that, but some specific chronic illness and medication had hit the point where it wasn't working anymore. And so he started looking into Eastern practices, started looking into you know, other ways of helping these people and found mindfulness. And so I feel like it's this practice that we're hearing a lot about now and we're hearing a lot about it because it really helps. And he saw some really great results with people just through you know, using these practices. So I thought I'd start by just sharing his definition of mindfulness. So mindfulness is 
awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment non-judgmentally so paying attention being aware of what's going on and a lot of mindfulness practices are about using all your senses so like you know what are you guys smelling right now right like what are you touching you know what are you looking at what are you hearing and so you know paying attention to those things that we're observing but we're not really noticing um, so on purpose you got to think about it like okay I'm, I'm trying to pay attention right now um, to the present and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second with anxiety and depression and how those mix with time um, and non-judgmentally so I really like the non-judgmentally part for myself and for a lot of people I talk to um, I feel like we have a tendency of putting labels on things right so there's you know you might look in the mirror and there's a bajillion labels you're thinking of and you know kind of what you were talking about with age can be a thing but that can also be happening at any stage of our life you know we can leave a conversation and kind of have a thought of oh that went bad or that went okay and you know those aren't bad things to do but those are also judgments right we're putting a label on what we experienced so mindfulness is about kind of taking off the labels and saying you know I wish I did smile look in the mirror. So you look in the mirror and you say, oh, there's a, there's a tallish person looking at me. I see, you know, whatever I see. I see blonde hair. I see, you know, glasses. And so instead of, you know, putting values on things you're seeing, it's just, this is what I see. I just talked to someone and we had a conversation. So mindfulness is kind of taking off the labels, not judging a moment, but just expressing that it was a moment. Did that make sense? Awesome, you guys are very nice. Um, so, one thing that helps me when I think about mindfulness and anxiety and depression is kind of thinking about a continuum. Um, so, if we're gonna think about fears, a lot of those have to do with the future. So we're kind of, the fears are, what if that happens in five years? You know, what if I get old and get Alzheimer's. You know, what if my friends all move away and I'm all by myself? What if I don't get into college? You know, those are a lot of fears that come from future. And if we take that to the, you know, kind of unhealthy part of that, it could go to, you know, anxiety, constant worry without being able to stop it. Um, muscle tension around, you know, not being able to sleep over these things that you're constantly ruminating with compulsions, panic. So that's kind of the extreme. But you know, that's thinking about a future in an area that we can't control. And then if you go to the other side of the continuum, there's the past. And so it's thinking, you know, when I talk to my high schoolers and middle schoolers, like, oh my gosh, last week there was a party on Instagram, I wasn't invited, and everyone was Snapchatting about it, and why didn't anyone invite me? You know, that's the past, it happened last week. It's very horrible, I'm not degrading their experience. I was in middle school once too. But, you know, that's the past. And I'm bringing it to now, because I'm thinking about it, I'm like, not wanting to talk to those girls anymore, like, I'm starting to think about myself because I wasn't invited, so what does that mean about me? The past. You know, I could, if, say I got fired five years ago, and it was a really horrible experience for me. And, you know, ever since then I keep thinking about, Gosh, I was fired, and what did that loss mean about me? You know, who am I now? You know, that's the past. And, you know, we all think about the past, and it's important to, we learn from the past, but if we get stuck in that, it can lead to things like hopelessness, right? It can lead to helplessness. It can lead to lack of motivation. You know, if I couldn't do it then, well, I can't do it now. If those girls didn't invite me last week, I'm definitely not going to talk to them anymore, and I'm not going to talk to anyone anymore because then no one can hurt me again. So it's important to think about both the past and the future, but if we stick in one area, we get stuck. And that can lead to kind of depressive symptoms if we keep going down that rabbit hole. So mindfulness is saying, I'm not going to the past, I'm not going to the future, I'm going to now. You know, it's not focusing on the things we can't control then, or, you know, can't control whatever grammatical thing that is in the future. Um, and we can't control back then 
in the past, we're, we're saying, okay, this is what I can control. This is what I can pay attention to because this is in my moment right now. You know, right now I'm standing here talking to a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. So that helps me a lot when I think about mindfulness. And often I feel like, you know, we kind of, as people, we go back and forth on the spectrum. And so mindfulness can kind of help us get back. So there are a lot of ways to do mindfulness. Um, I'll do a raise your hand again. Has anyone heard of like mindfulness apps? Oh, okay. Are mindfulness apps? Yeah, like on your phone? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Which one have you heard about? Um, my daughter has put one on mine. I, I can't think of the name of it. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. It's really <coughs> together, really together. That's like super cute. She's, she's that, I love that. No, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad I asked that because I was just going to assume, um, which is my own experience because I'm constantly looking at apps. So um, there are a lot of really great mindfulness apps that people are you know, sharing about right now. Um, Headspace is one of them that a lot of, you know, like more, it's kind of more for an adult or calm. And those have recordings you can listen to where they'll kind of walk you through a mindfulness practice. And so that's one type of mindfulness. A lot of times those are focusing on breath. So kind of how to pay attention to your breath. Kind of, and you'll listen to a recording and it'll say, and I'll, I'll lead you in one really quick so you can experience it. But it'll say like, okay, you know, pay attention to where you're noticing yourself breathing in and out. So you'll just kind of listen to it and try to focus in on that sensation of breathing, which is very present and we usually don't pay attention to. Um, so that's one practice of mindfulness. Another practice is mindful movement. Um, a common one of this is yoga. And it depends on which yoga you're doing. But a lot of the ones that are slow or flow yoga, that's more of a mindful thing. Um, you can do a mindful walk. So go outside, go on a walk. Do not bring your phone. Do not go through your to-do list in your mind. If you do, that's okay. Just tell your mind that you don't need to worry about it right then. Um, so pay attention to what you see. You know, what do you hear? Can you hear birds? What does it sound like when a car goes by? What does it feel like when the wind goes by? And, you know, if it's really hot, try not to say, like, oh, this is horrible, I'm really hot. But if you're trying to be mindful, then say, you know, I'm, there's sweat happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so that's the mindful version of that. You know, it's, it's not saying, like, it's good or bad. It's just like, oh, there's, there's sweat on my body. <laughs> you know? So it's a little bit different. You're not judging it, but you're just you're acknowledging that it's there. Um, and another, like, with mindful movement, it can be anything. Um, I like to mindfully wash dishes because I hate washing the dishes. Um, so I'll say, like, okay, right now I'm going to do a mindful practice while I wash these dishes. So I'll try to pay attention to what it feels like to wash the dishes. You know, and a lot of mindfulness is being curious. So I'll be like, all right, what does my soap smell like? You know, how warm is the water? What are my hands like? You know, and if I try to go to a to-do list, I'll come back. You know, try to get my thoughts back. And a lot of that, you know, the more you practice these different types of mindfulness, the more your thoughts, you realize that, like, you have a lot of control over your thoughts. You know, a lot of, you're able to face your thoughts and also kind of bring them back. And so the more you do that, the more your brain gets used to that, the more you can be in the present. So if you guys are cool with it, I'll lead you in a quick mindfulness. Um, it'll only be like three minutes, I promise. Um, so I will ask you guys to get in a comfortable seated position. Usually it's best if you have both your feet on the floor. Um, and Usually it's good if your back is kind of straight on the back of your chair. So make sure you can feel the back of your chair. Um, and then whenever you're ready, I'll ask you guys to close your eyes. And if you don't want to, that's okay. You don't have to close your eyes. You can focus on a point in the room that's like a stable point and kind of let your eyes like kind of focus on that or you can lose focus, whatever you're more comfortable with. And I'm going to tell you what to think about, and you don't have to verbally respond, just kind of mentally respond. So I just want you to start paying attention to how you're breathing. Can you notice where the breath is coming into your body? Is it coming in through your nose or your mouth? 
Can you feel it filling up your stomach or your chest? Are you breathing quickly? Are you breathing slowly? And if other thoughts come in, that's totally fine. Our brains always are thinking. But just try to imagine them floating on by. You can imagine them like a cloud. And then bring it back to your breath. And try to find a focus point where you feel the inhale. That could be through your nose. It could be through your mouth. It could be a point in your chest or your stomach. Find a place where you can feel that and kind of focus into it. I'm just going to have you guys count your breaths. So count one for an inhale, two for an exhale. And if you lose count, that's okay. Just start back at one. And then when you get to ten, you can count backwards. you are in your county, you can kind of come back to that point where you could feel your inhale. Notice what it feels like to be doing this practice. Any emotions that have come up for you, just kind of notice what they are. Okay, that's about it. Thank you guys. If I was professional, I would have a ding, but I didn't have a ding. Um, so that is a very brief mindfulness practice. If you liked that, cool. If you didn't, that's okay. There's a lot of other mindfulness you can do. Um, and if you have any questions about that, let me know. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, and I think when we're talking about you know, illness and things that could happen to us, um, we always, like you were saying, we think about what could happen in the future. And so focusing on the present uh, can be a really good way for us to control those emotions and get a grasp. Even if we are experiencing illness, um, the book talks about um, when we are in the midst of an illness because illness is something that we face. You know, we've all had a loved one or someone or ourselves go through an illness. Um, and even there's always great fear about what could happen, what will happen in the future to us because of that illness, um, but really trying to focus on where we are in this day and what we have and, and try to control um, the things that we can control um, is a really important component of that. So thank you. Um, the next topic that we have is dying. <laughs> Exciting, right? I know. <laughs> thank you. Um, so. You know, as Christians, we have a very distinct perspective on dying. Um, and we have, um, what, are, what are some of the things that we as Christians believe about dying? The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come, just our body dies. What else? Transition. Transition. What else? We will see our loved ones who've gone on ahead of us. Yeah. So we have this, this distinct perspective on dying. And one of the things that Adam talks about in his book is that oftentimes we are not fearful of the actual moment of death, but we are fearful about the things that will surround death, either us for us or for someone that we love. Right? We are more worried about that process and what will get us to that point than we are about that actual moment as Christians. I mean, we can still, you know, we're still going to be, we're still going to have questions and wonder what is it going to be like, um, and that's, that's fine, but most of our fear really, I think, comes from what's going to lead up to that. Um, what's that going to put, you know, what's that going to put our family through? What's it going to, what is the circumstance, what are the circumstances going to be like um, surrounding it? Um, and so... <clears throat> In scripture, Paul describes our physical bodies as clay pots, earthen jars um, that were made from clay and water. Um, 
sounds very biblical about how we were made, right, from the mud and, and um, from the earth. But um, earthen clay pots um, that were used for storing food and valuables um, but wouldn't last forever were easily broken. So I think there's a lot that we can, that we can uh, a lot of comparisons we can make between a clay pot and our human bodies that we, that we have. Um, and so um, this, is, this is one of those images that we have about kind of how fragile our, our human existence is. Um, one of the things that, um, that Adam talks about and, and that we have to be able to talk about and willing to talk about um, probably through mindfulness practices, I'm sure that can help, is, is what, what, are our, what do we want at the end of our lives? What is important to us, right? And I'm not talking about just planning for our funeral or, or making our will, but what, what is it that is, going to, that is going to make the end of our lives um, not easy, but as meaningful, um, and what is going to help us in those times? And I think oftentimes we don't do that. We don't think about it because we don't want to think about it, right? We think somehow that if we just don't think about the end of our lives, then we, maybe it'll never come. You know, we all at some point think that we're invincible. Um, you know, at some point in our lives, we, all, we, we don't necessarily grasp the, the finality of this life. Um, and so really, I think one of the things that we can do to lessen our fear is, is, to, is to talk about what it is that we want that to look like. You know, who, what's going to be the most comfortable? Who would we want to have around us? What are the things that would make us comfortable? Does that make sense? And we don't, we don't do that. And we can do that at any point, whether we're a certain age or not. It doesn't matter. Um, but I think um, it makes us uncomfortable. It might make people around us uncomfortable. Um, but it's, it's important to do and to really think about what it is that we what we want um, and what we think we will need. Um, one of the things that is also part of our, can be part of our Christian perspective um, that is not very helpful is this idea that, well, this life is wasting away, so it doesn't matter what I do or how I treat anybody or how I treat myself because this is just a mortal body and my spiritual body will live on. So there's this idea that we don't need to take care of ourselves, right? We don't need to care for other people. I mean, this is out there in the Christian realm um, of this body is just um, for a short period, so why should I worry about it? Um, and, and Adam points out that, that if that is not what we see, the example that we see Jesus setting in Scripture for us. Jesus, he is caring for people's very physical needs in Scripture, right? I mean, he is very much responding to the physical bodily needs that people may have. Um, and so we can't, we can't go so far as to think this world is not my home, so I'm just not going to worry about it. <laughs> um, because that's not what scripture tells us about caring for ourselves and caring for one another. Um, and Adam points out that, and we all know this, scripture doesn't say a lot about what heaven will be like, does it? It really doesn't. I mean, we have a few images of uh, there'll be no more tears and, and how beautiful heaven will be. There are a few scriptures, but scripture doesn't really tell us anything about what heaven will actually be like. Um, and so, but it's one of the things that I think all of us, when we're thinking about death and dying, it's one of the biggest questions of what is heaven going to be like? And I think one of the reasons for this is that the Bible, the point of the Bible is not about getting us to heaven. It's not just, um, you know, live this certain way and then you'll end up in heaven one day. But it is about working together to see heaven come to earth. So when we're thinking about heaven, when we're thinking about death and dying and all these things that are just realities for us, Scripture really shows us what it looks like to try to bring heaven here, if that makes sense. And so when we think about what it could look like for, um, for God's reign to be made known fully here, for, um, for us to work for uh, the well-being of people and for peace and for justice and for all these things that Scripture tells us will one day come to earth. Right? Scripture talks a lot about 
what God's going to do on earth one day. It doesn't really talk a whole lot about what God's going to do in heaven one day, but it talks a lot about what God's going to do on earth. And so I think when we're thinking about death and, and the process of death and what that will be like, I think some of our fears can be hopefully relieved when we think about and when we work to bring about heaven here, if that makes sense. When we think about what God intends, not just for us when we die, but also what God intends for us here and now. Um, and how God wants us to care for one another and to, um, to bring about God's vision um, for the earth. And, and so um, for Christians, faith is, is, we've talked about this, it's more than just beliefs or expectations that we might have. But it radically changes how we face it should, that's, you know, it's, it's um, just, it's so distinctive in who we are. Um, and so it doesn't, it doesn't make us necessarily less afraid of it, but it should be something that we can try to focus on instead of um, the other things that this world might want us to think about surrounding it. Um, so the last thing that, um, and these all fit together, I'm sure you can see how all of these topics really kind of fit together, is fear of the Lord. So um, one of the things Adam points out is uh, Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Any of you read that? Any of you read it to your kids to scare them into... (laughs) Brandon has, in case you're wondering. Um, So um, one of the... um, He quotes here... Just a brief part of it that says, The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or a loathsome insect over fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. I don't know what provoked him. I don't know uh, what experiences he had the week prior to preaching that sermon. Um, But I did see on Facebook... Um, are y'all familiar with Babylon B? It's like the onion, but for religious stuff, so it really kind of makes fun of ourselves. Um, and if we can't laugh at ourselves sometimes, then I think we have a problem. But it was a VBS theme, so I wish Kirby were in here so we could ask her about this for next year. But it was Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God, VBS. <laughs> cool, right? We're really missing out, I think. Um, and it said things at the bottom like games, food, and lots of fire. <laughs> That's an idea. We'll store that away. Um, but so this is kind of, at least for me, when I think of fear of the Lord, that's the first thought that comes to mind, is this vengeful, wrathful God. But this, the word fear here really refers to reverence, respect, and awe, of being awestruck of who God is and God's power. And I think that when we truly recognize the power of God over any of the fears that we have in this life, the sovereignty of God, when we truly recognize that reverence and respect and, and acknowledge it, then I think it in itself can help us with some of our earthly fears that we might have. Um, this healthy fear of the Lord helps us to understand the power of God in the midst of all things in the world that we might be afraid of. Um, so fear of the Lord is, is really an awareness that God is God and we are not. We say that, and we say that in a very kind of trite way sometimes, but it's something we need to be reminded of, I think. Um, It's something we we say, but we don't often actually believe. Um, And so the book talks about how insurance um, companies will sometimes refer to natural disasters as acts of God, um, and how um, that... You know, that's not, that's not really what, what it is. Really, most natural disasters are increasingly predictable, occurring phenomenon that plays some role in the equilibrium of our planet and what's happening with the shifts in, in the world and all of that. And so, um, so it's not really a helpful way for us to be thinking about natural disasters because that plays into this vengeful idea of God um, and God punishing certain people in a place um, with, you know, you heard it in, when the... Uh, in Haiti, right? There are people who said that God was punishing Haiti, um, which will definitely develop a fear of the Lord in you, but not really a healthy fear of the Lord, not a reverence or an awe for who God is. Um, and so 
one of the scriptures that is in our book, uh, and then I'll tell you just another a brief story, um, is, is on page 229. Um, this is a scripture that can help us really think about the fear of the Lord and who God is um, in comparison to us. But this is Psalm 91 through 4. It says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, Turn back, you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. And then um, another scripture that he quotes at the end of the book is Psalm 8, 3 and 4. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? And if there's a verse that sums up fear of the Lord, I think that is it for me. Um, it's this, this awestruck, being awestruck of who God is. And that God is so big and so powerful, yet God still cares for us. Still cares about our fears. Still cares about the things that we worry about. Um, and, and so when we think of fear of the Lord, I think those are helpful scriptures for us to look at. Um, I want to close with one quick story um, that's not from the book. It's from another TED Talk, so <laughs> I know. Um, but it's, it's about fear, and I think it kind of sums up some of the things that we've talked about in here. Especially this idea that fear um, is, is, our, is how we, it's thoughts that we have about the future that may or may not happen, and most likely will not happen. Um, but that it's our projecting into the future and making a reality for ourselves that is not necessarily or probably going to happen for us. Um, but this TED Talk is from Isaac Litsky, um, and he went blind from a rare genetic disease at a young age. Um, he's now a CEO of a company in Orlando, and he worked as a clerk for two Supreme Court justices. Um, and his video was entitled, What Reality Are You Creating for Yourself? Because I think when we're talking about fears, we're really talking about um, our realities um, that we create. Um, and so he, he says here, um, when he talks about his sight, he says, you see, sight is just one way we shape our reality. We create our own realities in many other ways. Let's take fear as just one example. Your fears distort your reality. Under the warped logic of fear, anything is better than the uncertain. Fear fills the void at all costs. Um, it substitutes assumption for reason. And psychologists have the term for this, awfulizing. So in our mind, fear replaces the unknown with the awful because anything is better than the unknown. So we have to create something in our head that's going to be that we can know or that we can trust in. Um, and so he, he talks about in his own life, um, well, he talks about how um, fear lulls us into inaction. So we, um, we passively watch as the prophecies that we have <laughs> that we have made up about the future actually come to fulfillment uh, because we're, we're unwilling, we're unable really to respond in a, in a helpful way. And so he talks about um, the reality that he created for himself when he was diagnosed with this disease. He knew that his life was over. He knew that he was never gonna have a successful career. He knew that, he, uh, that it was a death sentence that he wasn't gonna achieve or get married. He just, his life was over. And this is the reality that he created for himself. Um, he, this is what, um, he says it was a fiction born of his fears, but he believed it. It was a lie, but it was my reality. Um, and, um, and if he had not confronted the reality of his fear, he would have lived it. He was certain of that. And so his question is, how do you live life with your eyes wide open? How do you truly see? Um, you know, how do you... Um, truly, how are you able to really cope with, with the fears that we create um, for ourselves? Um, some of the things that he suggests, um, hold yourself accountable for every moment. I think this goes back to mindfulness. Um, being aware of what you're feeling and why you're feeling it. Um, see beyond your fears. Recognize your assumptions. Harness your inner strength. Silence your internal critic. Correct your misconceptions about luck and about success. Accept your strengths and your weaknesses and understand the difference. Open your heart to your bountiful blessings. 
goes on to say your fears, your critics, your heroes, your villains, they are your excuses. So your excuses, your rationalizations, your shortcomings, your justifications, your surrender. They are fictions you perceive as reality, and we have to choose to let them go. So what he, what he talks about and how he ends his speech is that he has a beautiful wife, triplets, and another baby. Um, he talks about being a CEO of this company <coughs> and how he, since he can't see when he's in meetings with his, um, the other leaders in his company, he can't depend on physical or uh, visual cues, you know, which we all have in meetings. We have what we say and then we have kind of what we do with our body and, and how we respond physically. Um, but he says that in his meetings, since he can't depend on those, it makes people talk more in his meetings. Um, and it makes people feel valued and that their opinions matter because he encourages them to share. And so it's really enhanced his business instead of killing it like he thought that it would um, when, he, when he created this reality for himself, if that makes sense. Um, and so, um, so the truth for us, I think, is that as Christians, we, we create our own realities, right? We, we project into the future the things that might happen. Um, but we also have a reality as Christians. We have this reality of the kingdom of God. We have the reality um, of, of all that God wants for us. We have these expectations we set for ourselves. And then we have who we are in God. Um, and I think aging, illness, and dying, while they're all um, difficult things to deal with and things I think at any point in our lives we're fearful of because we're humans, um, because we don't, we don't like not knowing what's going to happen. Um, they can be given a different perspective when we think about them through the reality that God has for us. Um, so we can be like Isaac, the person in, in this TED Talk, and we should not let the realities that we create for ourselves, um, we should not let them fill the void of the unknown so that we live in fear. We should try to live each day grateful for the life that we have, grateful to God that we worship, um, and remember that the God who we worship is so much bigger than any of our fears. Um, that our true fear, awestruck, our, the awesomeness of God should really be where we focus our attention. Um, because I think then it will help us be able to handle any of the fears that we might experience in this life. Let's pray. Lord of life and conqueror of death, you have shown us how to confront the fears we face each day. From the terrors of the night to the future we cannot see, you have promised to be with us. We go forth to live unafraid with love for you and for our neighbors. In the strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Any other announcements, Cindy? We good? We're good. All right.